We're very pleased to present this particular session for this year's Great Lakes Media Show. Thanks for being here today. This is Room 205, Production Algebra, and I'm pleased to introduce my good friend from the Michigan Production Alliance, Mr. Mark Adler. Mark? Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. Hi, guys. Thanks for coming. So I am Mark Adler. Michigan Production Alliance is uh, an organization that has been around since uh, 2003. Uh, our purpose was to, uh, and still is, to uh, be a nexus for information, to provide educational um, opportunities for both veterans and people just coming into the industry. Uh, we provide uh, monthly meetings for, uh, again, everybody that's in the production industry, and the idea is to help people get a real good hold on the industry as they get started or as they're moving along, getting more information, getting uh, new equipment, knowledge, that sort of thing. But today, uh, I'm going to be kind of in, a, in an instructor portion, a kind of uh, opportunity for me. Um, I have been teaching since uh, college times. I went to Michigan State. Uh, I was in the TV program there. Uh, I started training people back then and running around with a video camera back then. It was really heavy. On, it wasn't a handheld unit. It was a with a porta pack, camera with a porta pack on it. So you had to really want to do it to go out and do that. Uh, after Michigan State, I started training uh, at a cable company. They had uh, public access coming up in the 80s. So I uh, trained people at McLean Hunter Cable TV, built a studio, built a truck, developed some of my own skills. After that, I got into commercials um, and uh, corporate events, and finally into feature films. So I've got a lot of experience in various markets, large budgets, small budgets. Um, here's more about the Alliance, uh, 501c6. That's what we do. Every state has one, and uh, we urge you to join us. Consider it. We've got some information right up here at the front, and uh, I hope you'll consider that. Um, before I get into that, I'm sorry, uh, there's also social media. That I'm going to walk away. Sorry, John. I should mention that uh, we're on social media. You can find us on Facebook. We're on LinkedIn. We've got uh, podcasts called InFrame on SoundCloud. Uh, we've got some of our streamed podcasts on YouTube, Michigan Production Alliance. And we've got uh, various projects on Flickr under Michigan Production Alliance. So check us out. Um, the organization, again, has been around for a while. We should be easy to find through a search. So. Adapting to a changing world happens, right? You just, um, how many people's parents were working like a GM, Ford, or nine to five job, right? I mean, mine too, right? That's not happening as much anymore. There's some staples, there's, you know, they gotta be people in the auto industry doing that, but not in the world that you're looking at right now. It's more of a gig economy, so you have to kind of um, develop skills that are not available in many places. I mean, going to school is a great opportunity. Um, if a lot of people ask me if college is necessary, and I said, are, are there college graduates? Are you college guys? Yeah? Okay. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, actually, um, so our last year, we were kind of the guinea pigs for the first time they did um, like a year long class, so that it was more, it was a lot more just getting out there and doing it. Oh, yeah. But it's a lot of struggle when it doesn't really be the like academic, how they normally structure classes. Oh, you're right on the, uh, the tip of the spear. <laughs> that's right. I've been there many times. I understand that. Right, and that's what it's like out there in the world. I've been in, t Wally, uh, some of the, you were in that other session about budgeting. I've been in situations where I'm, I'm the other guy, I'm the labor, and I'm thrown into a situation with a new piece of equipment that just came into the market, and now I've got to make that work. Now, fortunately, I have experience behind me, so I can, you know, fuss in my way through it, muddle my way through it, and I have to make it work, and I often do. Um, okay, Ooh. okay, a little advertisement. I've got a book that I wrote in uh, 2008, and updated as an ebook in 2018 called Production Algebra. A lot of what I do is based on that book right now. It talks about. Uh, being a production assistant, but that's by all means not all we talk about in the boot camps. It's more of an overview of the film 
industry, corporate industry, and um, uh, commercial industry as well. So we also have t-shirts for sale and we're going to raffle off some t-shirts and books today. Okay, so production algebra, right? Some, you know, there's no math involved in this, but it is a, an equation. And if you own the book, you can find it on page 35. But it really is about your passion, how much passion you put into it, how much hard work you put into it equals the amount of work that you get. You really have to want it to make it happen. Um, a PA, there's so many opportunities for you. You can work on a live show. You can work on a commercial. Every two years and four years, there are political events that occur that you can be involved in, in whether it's a, a rally or it's a spot. I've done this as well. I didn't mention what I do. Uh, I'm a teleprompter operator for commercials, music videos, and a variety of other things, so I know what I'm talking about here. I've also been a cameraman. I run uh, RoboCams for the Detroit Symphony, and uh, I've been video assist on feature films. Video assist is instant replay. If you've ever looked at behind the scenes of uh, fe feature films, you see the director peering into a monitor. I provide that work. It's a great position to be in because you learn a lot. Okay, so translatable skills. If you have a job that you like right now or something that you learned early on in your career, um, and you're not in the media business, right? You can translate that skill. I've worked with people that have been police officers that wanted to get into the industry. I made an entree for them. I mean, I'm not saying that I can get everyone work, but I made an entree for them. As a police officer, they were good at crowd control. They were good at details. They were able to get a job. This woman was able to get a job as a location scout because of a translatable skill, something that she had known for at least 15 years in her life and she translated that into the film industry. Um, an electrician in an auto factory might not be the same. It's a little different. In the factory, you're on a, a cart, and you're told what to do, and you just do it. You have a checklist. As a uh, film electrician, it's totally different. You're outside, you're in the studio, you're self-motivated. You have to get the job done. You're sort of told what to do, but not how to accomplish it. So various ways of getting that. Um, the glamour of the business. You've worked on documentaries, I heard you say. Is that glamorous all the time? Oh like boy. As, you, as you thought it might be? I don't know if glamorous. I think that our improv skills have definitely helped us out this room. Right. That's it. I know. I mean, the first job that I worked on where it rained the entire day, you know, that lost the glamour for me right there. So, you know, but you have to come back smiling, right? You know, it, it's, it's attitude is probably 99% uh, of it. So you have to make that happen. Um, everyone can't be a creative person, right? Not everybody's going to be the director. Not everyone's going to be the camera operator. There are positions for administrative. Um, here I'm showing, you know, someone that's lining up a shot. Here's Zach uh, Snyder in that increasingly fuzzy photo, and he's looking at storyboards from Batman. Um, he's doing, he's, a director has to be everything. Your administrative, your, your production design, but you have people around you that help you, you sketch it out. Um, in many areas, uh, administrative means um, accountants, for example. You can be a production accountant on a movie or a commercial and travel around the country doing that job and you're a rock star you've got a it's not it's not a full-time job but it's like a full-time job what we call sometimes a uh, permalancer where you're always working for a company or two doing that kind of a job there is structure in our business it looks like kind of uh, often cats uh, hurting cats um, but it is organized this is a uh, this is a production meeting early on in a motion picture this fellow is uh, reading what we call a one line, which shows you what 55 days will look like in less pages than that. And each page has maybe eight days listed on it, whether they are days or nights. Uh, but everyone here represents what we call keys or apartment heads. And they're all talking together. You know, we're in the communication business. And I was talking to Dirk earlier. Oftentimes, we just don't communicate. There's so many things that we miss. But these production meetings together are designed to, to you know, hit that head on. 
Everyone's there. You need a question, you need a question answered from the carpentry department or uh, design. I can talk about all the departments that are on a film, and we might a little bit later, but everyone's there. You can ask all the questions right there. So, as I said, so here's some of the departments. Uh, production sound, grips, camera, lighting, construction, art department, costuming, um, post-production, hair and makeup, script supervisor. All of these departments are real, and they have a very good opportunity for uh, lifetime work as a career. Sadly, in Michigan, you know, we don't have a lot of feature films right now, but we do have commercials and corporate work that goes on, and we use many of, well, most of these things are there. So you just scale it down. If you want to learn, and Michigan is a great place to learn, Detroit is a great place to learn, and if you can make it in Detroit, you can make it anywhere in the country. It's, it's a true fact, and people that have come to Michigan to shoot feature films and commercials, they recognize the talent. Do you know, have you ever heard the term work ethic? We have that work ethic, it's a marketable thing. People have noticed it and talk about it. That's what makes Michigan a marketable place, incentives are not. So, as I say, these are all marketable skills. Um, you can learn from each department and you have to work together. Teaming is very important. Um, this is my friend Jessica Lopez. Uh, she worked in Michigan for a while. She moved out to LA. She started doing feature films. And it's important to note that men and women get equal pay on these jobs. It's all about your skill level, how you deal with people, and, uh, and how you do your work. So, Jessica, she's running a Steadicam uh, school in LA right now. I can put you in touch if you want to do that job. Um, so, you know, most things you remember about the first day of school, kind of butterflies in the stomach. I was going to say tummy, but um, it's like that on a feature film. You know, every department, if you're in wardrobe, makeup, camera, you meet people that you might not know because they're from all over the country. And you have to get together and define your roles and, and figure out how you're going to do this job from your department. Please stop me if there's any questions too. I, I don't want to leave you hanging if I go too fast over this. So a workflow example. Um, if you're in the uh, costuming department, for example, on a feature film, people are going to wear wardrobe of various kinds. That's our costumes. They're going to wear their party clothes at night. They're going to wear work clothes in the morning. That kind of thing. Someone has to keep track of those. So uh, wardrobe would be uh, taking care of those clo clothes. And each day, you know what clothing is going to be worn. Someone has to label those, take a picture of the talent with those clothes on so they know that they fit. If they don't fit, a seamstress comes in and adjust them. So everything works, everything's labeled, and then it's put on a truck and brought to the set as needed. And then they have to bring extra stuff because they might change their minds. Herding cats. Uh, production office. Uh, if you have a skill as you know someone that's worked in an office before, production office is very similar to that, but it's like a mash unit, if that makes sense to people that this some of you, of you are younger, you may not know about MASH, a mobile uh, army, uh, what is it called, a mobile army uh, surgical unit, yeah, hospital. So uh, it's like a MASH, you set it up, and it's set up for maybe a month, and then you take it down. And set up means all the forms, all the paperwork, copy machines, phone lines, fax, they still use fax machines, um, water, internet, all that stuff has to be set up usually by a team of two or three people. A camera department. Uh, if you've ever run a camera, you know they've got cards in them. There's various kinds of cards. We might use, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 different cards in a day, and that's on a low level. On uh, the film Red Dawn that I worked on in 2008, not the one back in the 80s, but uh, that one we shot up to 10 cameras. I was video assist on that one, and they were running through terabytes of data all the time so but that was that was film that was on film but still it had to be transferred um, each of those drives has to be labeled 
each camera. Usually the, the primary camera's red, second camera's blue, then after that it's dealer's choice. You just have to code them so that the cameras, the lenses, the, uh, the filters, everything that goes along with that camera, it's usually not owned by any particular individual, it's owned by a rental company, it gets back there. You've got to order it. I talked about wardrobe. G&E means grip and electric. So that also, there's stands, for example, light stands, everything has to be labeled. So it gets back to the right place. There was one company, a grip company, you know what a grip is? Am I going over? Okay. So um, one company decided that it would be cool to paint all their C stands, their silver stands, black, flat black. And it was great until what happened? Anyone? Night shooting. Yeah, they lost some stands, their, black, their sandbags were black. It's not the ideal color for a location shooting. So a production assistant, that's kind of an entry level position. That's one of the many positions that you can do in the entry level. I try to help people get jobs as like a set photographer. That's a great job to have. Or, um, or as I said, uh, location scout. But uh, production assistant is some place that you can get in, you can get on set and, and meet people and network. Networking is the, one of the most important things. I'd say it's right on top of the list, the most important thing. Develop a network of people and then you can get these jobs. Uh, every job you develop a new friend, and I'm talking about friends here. You develop friendships. It's not just work buddies. Sometimes it's work buddies, but friends is what is the goal. You want to have friends that help you out and you help them out. Um, you know about freelance work, right? Freelance work, you get paid, hopefully, every job that you're on. But there's also, when you're on a feature film, um, it's seasonal labor. You are now an employee. You are W-2'd, which means they take taxes out that's less for you. You don't have to worry about quarterlies on that film. They're taking taxes out, but now you are an employee. Uh, things are changing in the tax world for freelancers. A lot of my clients, as a freelancer, now tax me anyway, because that's the way the IRS wants it to be. Um, yeah, so, and, and each of these jobs, you have to wear a different hat. You have to be ready for anything on that. But I've talked to assistant directors or ADs around the country. My favorite one was uh, uh, John Wallach uh, from New York. Um, he told, I asked him specifically, what, you know, what does a PA need? What do you look for in a PA? Someone that you know, has a good head on his or her shoulders, but someone that has a working pen was his idea because he stood there too many times tapping his foot when there, he's giving a direction for the notebook and they're not ready, the pen doesn't work something like that. Not everybody has a photographic memory to remember the six directions that this guy's going to give you. So that's an important and uh, true story right there. Keep a head on your shoulders. There's new jobs out there in the world, some that weren't out there 10 years ago. This is an image of an optica, octocopter and its pilot. This job wasn't out there until recently. So now you've got three new positions on a commercial or a feature film. It's the pilot, it's the operator, and there's a spotter to make sure you're not hitting any lines or trees or anything like that. Three new jobs out there for a commercial or a feature film. It's a marketing tip, kind of. You, you, you look for those kind of things after you develop that skill. Um, this fellow right here, Alan Bell, please look him up online because he, he calls himself an autodidact, someone that has learned on his own. He says that uh, when he's on a shoot, he's married, he has a couple kids, but when he's on a shoot, he's living in a hotel. He's not gonna go to the bar and party. He's, he's got to be ready. If the director walks into his room and says, I wanna see these three scenes, and he's trying to figure out how to use the editing software or a new plug-in, he's ready with that, he's always learning. So that's what he does, self-directed learning. And that's how it is in my industry. And, and more and more, it's easier. I mean, I can look up on YouTube most things that are out there, how to operate them, basics beyond just an NAB preview, right? But I've been in situations where the piece of equipment is so new, like Blackmagic just came out with a 4ME panel, and there was nothing but demo promotions. Didn't show me anything. But 
you try to look for those things and they are out there. So um, what is expected of you on a set is the most important thing. What kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of attitude do you have? You've got to walk in there strong. Be strong. Walk in like you know a couple of things. Um, one idea is that, um, and this is based on an experience I had. I got a guy on a show. It was a big movie in uh, Flint. And he walked on the set. And he'd never seen what a film set looks like. Have you? Has anyone here seen a big film set at all? Okay, so a film set looks like this. You'll have a base camp, so there'll be uh, 20 trailers that are around there. The director's in one, uh, talent, highly paid talent, is in a motorhome. Um, the AD department, the assistant directors are in another truck. Every department is in a truck, and then there's dressing rooms. So it's a, it's a maze of vehicles. And then there's cables lying everywhere. And then there's sets, there's, there's signs that tell you where set is, but if you're there, you know, you're looking around like, you know, wow, this is, you know, I can't find my place. So uh, he didn't, ha he, my instruction would be to get on the walkie talkie and find a, a, an AD or the production assistant over you, but he didn't have a walkie talkie. So he called me and I told him to do that thing. I said, you know, you find the AD's trailer and talk to him and you know you won't look like a fool they're not going to say hey this guy doesn't know where he's going on the radios which are open for everyone to hear so it's a good thing so there's small crews on jobs where it might be just these two guys um, and it's a cool learning environment you've been on small crews guys I mean some of you guys you're in radio right is that it you work in, in a small crew environment Not small or large. right Broadway Bro Broadway I didn't know that. We'll have to talk about that. Okay. Thank you. But um, small crews is a camera operator, hopefully a sound person and a lighting person at the very least. But everyone helps out to find power, safely pack it down like we have this over here, <laughs> mostly. Uh, set up the tripod, camera, audio. It's not so compartmentalized as on a larger show where it's a union job and everyone does their job only. So on small crews, that's where you train up. That's where you learn so much and get going. You can, you, somebody's going to be willing to help you set up a director's monitor. Someone's going to be willing to show you how audio. Don't go into the red. You know, it can, it can go there, but don't let it live there kind of thing. Uh, watch for traffic that's around you. Listen for planes. Help out as much as you can. This is a large show. This guy right here is my friend, Nico. And he worked on this film in New York. I can't remember the name of it, but the Olsen twins were on it. Um, this was so. This is an older picture. They're still using film. And New so, York hmm? New York uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I should write that down in here. Do I have it? No, I don't. So, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so you see, this is just the set crew. <clears throat> this is on set crew, and. There's probably, what would you say, 100 people there, minimum? So they've got a production office, you've got base camp too. Those guys are not in the picture, but large crews are really large. And Nico's job is a painter, he's wearing the classic painter's uh, bibs. But, um, you know, there's camera department probably out front. Um, PAs are way in the back. It's a big show. You can learn a lot on big shows too, but it's more compartmentalized. So right, now there's going to be a team that runs the set. On a movie, if you're a production assistant and you're just getting started, um, you're going to walk and talk to the ADs, the assistant directors. They're the ones that hire a, um, PAs. Okay? They run the set. Um, it's usually a team. There are probably three people on that team, the, the, the assistant director, the, uh, the second assistant and the second second, not the third, but the second second. Someone that writes up all that, does all the paperwork and all the drudge work while the first and the second are working on set. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, yeah, and they're going to be union crews, and you can get into a union. The major union around the country is uh, IATSE, it's actually around the world. International Alliance of Theatrical and Stage Employees. They cover a lot of different crafts. 
uh, like camera, wardrobe, makeup, hair, various things. I've got a list of those on the back of this. Are those easy to join, Walmart? Those big uh, unions like that? Sure, yeah. Really? If you've got the experience, you write a letter, you explain your experience, and they're willing to let you in. Now, there's, you know, have you tried? Uh, not currently, but okay. I've been I, thinking about that would be next. I've heard stories. I mean, it's not cheap to join a union while we're talking about it. Right. I mean, a camera, if you want to be a union camera operator, it's, I think, uh, $3,000 to get in. That's an initi initiation fee. So you got to really be working to do that. So even for my, uh, I'm a union uh, video assist, and it was, uh, when I got in, which is a while back, it was $1,500 to get in. But I worked that off in um, six months. So it's doable. So corporate jobs, cool jobs to get on. I mean, if you like research, corporate jobs are great. I've been at Ford in the research area where they've saved uh, still photos, uh, Super 8 film, uh, 30, uh, 35 mm, millimeter film, everything. And they, they use that for all their events because they're going to celebrate every year that they're in business. So it's a great job. Sometimes they'll send you as a production assistant to go into the archives and check, you know, find something for their, uh, what are they coming up on there? They're coming up on their 200th birthday in, I don't know, probably a decade. So watch for a big event from Ford. Um, yeah, they, did, they still make newsletters. There's corporate updates. Sometimes there's going to be a live show. Um, has anyone worked on the auto show around? No? Yeah, you have, right? In January, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> So the auto show has been a great job for people. It's a big corporate production. Uh, all the auto companies are there. It used to be in January, so now there's a big hole in every freelancer's work in January. So this is the first year, so we're still kind of smarting from that. But in, uh, in June, June 9th and 10th is press day, but probably uh, starting in April, they're going to start building that show, but they're going to be building it for outside truss and uh, and big screen TVs all over the city. Ford Field at the LCA, what I call the Slice, everywhere around the city. It's going to be a walking tour. So that's a great thing. That's a great place to go. And if you want to get work there, it's about, um, well, like anything else, it's about who you know. And uh, contact me and I can give you some tips on that. But it changes, and again, this is a June show. I'm not sure if everyone's still on board. But another interesting thing about that is, do you think that's the only thing going on in June? Rolling Stones are coming the 9th and 10th. They're going to be downtown. Comerica's got a game going on that those two days. Um, the Gem Theater has days. Anyway, there's lots of stuff. So if you get in downtown, you're not getting out right, for, that, for those two days. It's going to be a big thing. Permalancer, I mentioned that earlier. Sometimes you can get a job for a company like uh, Jack Morton or Jackson Dawson. Um, you can become a producer real fast if you know what you're doing. You can be the person that supervises edits or, or be the on-site location um, producer or assistant producer. Those are great jobs to get. It's small enough where they'll give you just enough rope to see if, you, you know, if you're doing the job. Um, yeah, so opportunity to learn, right. Um, on commercials, a production assistant, I don't have the intro slide, I dropped it. Um, there's media drops that have to be made. Uh, on a film or commercial, twice during the day, they're going to have to drop the media card at a place that's like a post house or whoever's editing. And sometimes it's the producer's house where that person's editing. So. Someone's going to do that, it's going to be the production assistant, lowest on the totem pole kind of thing, and you are told where to go and you drop off that media safely. You do not put it in the back seat of your car, don't wait until after lunch. You know, people have been fired for those kind of jobs. Um, sometimes you pick off uh, camera gear and, and grip equipment if it's a smaller job, otherwise it's the grips and the gaffers that do that work. But sometimes you'll be charged to do that. And if you do that, there's a whole list of protocols that you have to follow. It's a list of cameras, it's a list of batteries, it's a list of 
all the support equipment, and you have to make sure of the time of the rental house, that it's open, and when the return times are. Sometimes if you return it after, uh, I think it's 10 o'clock on a day, you'll get the production company will be charged an additional day or some amount. So you want to avoid that for them, so you look good. Um, sometimes you are called to do security or fire watch on a job. Um, on a commercial or a feature film, if they're shooting on a location that's um, hot, so to speak, if, where there's like you're in a grocery store or you're in a bank, someone's got to make sure that no one walks onto set, no one leaves a coffee cup or a bottle of water on set after everyone else goes to lunch. It's a, it's a job that a PA would have. Sometimes in a bigger feature film, they'll hire on additional personnel to lock down sets. Um, in Chicago, I was four blocks away from uh, one of the sets of Batman, and they had a PA standing out there four blocks from set, just making sure that no one's getting close. So, you know, in that case, what do you do? You know, you're far away from set, your lifeline is a walkie-talkie that hopefully you have extra batteries for, a backpack with extra energy bars, and a beverage, that sort of thing, because you're not coming back until lunch or dinner if it's an overnight shoot. So, but they'll have lots of people doing that. They might have 20 additional people walking, uh, locking down a perimeter. Um, there's always something to do as a production assistant. Um, even if it's not very busy, you're supposed to kind of look busy. I always found when I was a production assistant that a good broom in the hand worked really well. You were always sweeping something up. All the departments can't move. Sound can't move. My video assist department, I can't really move while we're shooting. And if there's no waste baskets near me, I'm going to drop the stuff on the floor near me. So that's got to be picked up and hopefully with green in mind, with recycling in mind, um, it's picked up and put away in the proper place. That's a job for a PA. PA is first to come and last to leave. Right? You're there before everybody else, so you know the lay of the land. Uh, somebody's going to do what, do you know what craft services is? Yep, craft services. Craft services is another entry level position. It's uh, food, basically. It could be as simple as donuts and coffee, and that's how it started at MGM Studios back in the 30s, but it grew into like coffee, tea, donuts, muffins, you know, omelets, you know, it could be something more than that. Because no one can leave the set and, uh, you know, a, a crew that's been fed is a happy crew. So that's what craft services. It's a great thing. You can do that yourself by a truck. I, I had a job, um, one of my first jobs as a PA where I was doing craft services. And I made a, uh, a seafood dip that involved cream cheese and, uh, and a shrimp sauce that my mother gave me. And that, I think that gave me more work. People liked it so well. So it's a good position to start in. So this is a commercial view. This is what uh, a commercial shoot might look like on an exterior shoot. You've got a uh, still photographer, set photographer over here. Uh, this camera right here. There are two cameras working, right? one over here and one over there. Um, this is a camera card that's got extra camera bodies or lenses on it. Um, let's see what else. They're, they are keeping, um, it might be a very sunny day where they are getting direct sun, so they've got those uh, dark solid uh, flats on, on their camera. But you've got a talent right here, hero talent right here for this camera. And there's a lot going on here. Where do you think the technical people are? I know it's hard to see, but they're going to want to be out of the sun. So they're all under that tent, nice and cozy, out of the sun. You've got sound in there, you've got video assist in there. Here's a, uh, that's a battery charger over there for the walkie-talkies. So, and then this table over here is for props. Props department, that's anything that the actors touch. Props department is keeping everything ready to go for each different thing. This looks like an athletic uh, clothing commercial. Kind of cool, huh? But a lot of people working, a lot of different things going on, a lot of wheels turning. So 
as a commercial PA, um, as opposed to a corporate PA, you're not, you know, you're just doing the day. You might have a pre-production day, a production day, and maybe a wrap day if you're lucky, or if it's a bigger job, a couple more of those days in between. Um, but these are what you have to deal with, and the more you know about how to work with union personnel, for example, you don't pick up a sandbag or a grip stand unless you're allowed to. That kind of thing. You have to, you know, have a little interdepartmental love, and um, that that comes up a lot. People want to be helpful, but you can't just grab stuff because it's in a place because it's, you know, going to be used. So you have to um, make sure that you have permission. Follow the AD's instructions. Um, as I said before, making runs and cleaning up. It's not that hard, but you can get paid well doing this job. Okay. This is a feature film. What's been added here is a couple of things. We might notice a tank in the background. Um, there is, uh, there's probably a hundred extras in here that are an audience. This is a, this device right here is a techno crane, a device which has a camera on the end and can push out silently up to uh, 75 feet. So there, that camera's going to go into the speaker probably at that lectern when we go. Uh, the sound man is over there hiding out. I'm taking this shot from one of our 10 cameras that day up in a building on, uh, this is uh, Griswold and Lafayette for Red Dawn. So those trailers are going to be blown up by the tank in a couple of minutes. Um, and all these guys are going to run. Because we've also, you know, so there's like 10, like I say, there's 10 cameras going on here. A lot of people, a lot of workers, a lot of labor, and a lot of hours. We've got to catch this shot before the sun goes down. And there's a lot to it because we not only do this <coughs> shot over here, we're doing this shot over here coming back at the audience. Um, and intricate shots of people's hands, or there's going to be an explosion here too. We blew stuff up at least twice a week on that show. And um, so they want to catch every detail, coverage, they call that. But the more cameras you have, the less you have to do, ultimately, with that coverage. You're covering it all at once. So that's a big show. And PA for a feature film, it's long hours, 32 days. Uh, I worked on a film called Eight Mile, which was uh, ended up being 64 days. Um, you could be hired as a person that comes on as just a, a single day or four days. That's a day player. You're not on for the run of the show. So there's all, all sorts of opportunities. Um, if you're a really good PA and you have designs on being a, an assistant director, which is a path to being a director perhaps, um, you can tell the DGA assistant directors that and they will watch you and see what you can handle and maybe they'll let you run the set or do blocking send cars when they're needed, send people when they're needed, that sort of thing. So it's kind of a cool thing to do. Um, that office work I mentioned, um, there are scripts that are eight and a half by 11. Um, when on a show, they want to give you what are called sides, so they fit in your pocket. They're about half the size of that eight and a half by 11 sheet. So as a production system attached to the office, you might be asked to use a reducer on the, co on the uh, copy machine. Some people don't know how to do that, but it's a nice skill that not everybody has. Some people even don't know how to use a fax machine. They're not in the vogue anymore. Um, work in TV studios? You guys know, right? Somebody knows about camera. Um, cameras, you have to be you know, rolled back away from the set while they reset, um, wrap the cables up properly. Um, sound cable, the same thing, it's up on a board, but you're always in the same place and you can keep it nice and clean and you're just building new sets. So TV studio work is, uh, is pretty cool, stable work. Sometimes you're asked to do a lot of different things. Like I say, I'm a teleprompter operator and that's what I do. I don't build sets, although I have. I don't build sets. Occasionally I'll run a camera, but that's my job. In a TV studio, you're building a set, and then they want you to run the prompter. So it's it's a little different. And they've got limited budgets, and a lot of those camera positions are now robocams. Do they have that 
here? I don't know. In Detroit, Channel 7's morning <coughs> show is RoboCams uh, from Broadcast House. The robots are run from Broadcast House in Southfield to Detroit. So that's kind of interesting. Um, safety. Does anyone know about Sarah Jones? Can I tell you about Sarah Jones? Sarah Jones was a 23-year-old, well-loved camera assistant in Georgia. She was working on Walking Dead and Vampire Diaries and all these great shows. And my friend uh, Andy Hone from Detroit, who moved down to Atlanta to keep working, uh, met her. This woman was working on a film called Midnight Rider with William Hurt about uh, uh, one of the Allman brothers. And uh, they were shooting on a train track. Right? They weren't authorized to shoot on that train track. The location manager did not obtain position, um, permission to do that. But they went ahead and they did that. They had sound, uh, film, camera, two camera assistants, uh, makeup, hair, wardrobe. They were all on a train trestle, on a hill near a train trestle. The train came very, fit, very quickly. And she, being the dutiful AC that she was, was safe. And then she went back because she saw film cans and different lenses that were very expensive near the tracks. She didn't judge it properly, and she didn't get hit by the train. She got hit by a stretcher that was on the tracks that William Hurt had been laying in. And she got shrapnel injuries and died. So now... There's a lot of people in our industry that think that there's a film immunity, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Now there's been a rethinking of that. Uh, I hate to be a downer on that, but you know, you've got to be safe on a job. If you see something that is unsafe, you have to mention it to your immediate supervisor and don't be afraid of being fired for not wanting to do something that's unsafe. You are safe, it's okay. And to develop that even further, make sure that everyone in your, in your department, even if it's one or two of you, agree that it's unsafe. So they're not gonna fire you for that. So Sarah, the first shot of the day around the country, if not around the world, has been the Sarah, or Sarah Jones. So we're trying to push that around the country and around the world. Um, okay, so um, on some jobs, when you're not a uh, union job, you're a camp, you can be put into the slate department, you can be put <laughs> into a situation where you're running a slate. Um, a slate is just a clapper board, that's another term for it. You've probably seen the cartoon version where they slap it real hard and run away, right? Just don't do that. Um, if that is handed to you, if that job is there, you have to communicate with a couple of people, script supervisor, sound, and the camera assistant to find out how they like it done while you're doing that job. You're keeping track of tapes, not as simple as you might think. It's not just take one, take two, take three. There might be A's and B's and C's in those numbers there. For example, if uh, it's take one and then they move the camera or they zoom in, now it's apple, one apple, one A. So you have to be conscious of that and be co communicating with everyone. It goes all the way to Z with uh, the exception of some letters that look like other letters. What a boy. Anyway, so you keep track of the tapes. If there's film speed used, you write them down on the slate, or if it's a digital slate, that's done. Um, if they say stick it, they're not being mean. It just means get the slate in there, make sure it's near a light so everyone can see it, and get out. If they say second sticks, it's because something wasn't working properly. Um, whether the camera wasn't on, sound wasn't running, or there's uh, an airplane, they're gonna you know, stop the camera, and then you've gotta go back in there, still camera uh, take one, not take two, and go back in, second sticks. Uh, quiet sticks if there's um, highly paid talent, children, or animals on the set. You never slap it like those cartoons. It's always very quiet because someone's concentrating. In the case of animals, you know, I've, I've worked with leopards, I've worked with cougars. You don't want to slap and make you know, loud noises with them. Um, sometimes you don't even put a slate in the shot because uh, as, the, as in the case with children or non-professionals, if they see a slate, they know enough that that means the next thing that's gonna happen is the camera's rolling and now they can be scared. 
So what you want to do is just roll it because maybe the director or, or the interviewer has started talking to them and just gotten them warmed up and you just look at each other and you know say that and just you know, roll the thing and then at the end of the shot you turn it over upside down as an end slate and call out end slate and then turn it right back up so the editor can see what the thing is. That's an end slate. Okay, so walking on set, everyone has a cell phone now, right? It's like they're ubiquitous, so you just have to, you know, make sure that at the beginning of the show that as an AD you're told, you know, everyone have their, their phones on quiet. Uh, the same is true of two-way radios. Everyone on the set has a two-way radio. If you're far, four blocks away, it's fine, but if you're right in your camera, and you don't have what we call uh, an earpiece, like a surveillance headset in your ear, um, it's going to squawk. It's going to make a lot of noise that people aren't going to appreciate. Uh, and even conversations can crescendo. You get two or three people talking, and then, ha, 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 it loses people's attention. People get uh, upset about that. You don't want that to happen. Let the ADs know, walk away, and you're good. All right, so I've worked with a lot of talent that, that are professional and um, somewhat approachable. Some, some others are not. Um, Robert De Niro was not, but um, Edward Norton was, for example. I was able to have a conversation with them. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Um, Jack Nicholson was, as Jimmy Hoffa, very approachable. Really nice guy, but other people, you have to use some discretion and not go there. Um, in our business, no autographs. You can't walk up to talent if you're on the sh crew and ask for an autograph. It's just not done. Um, and the reasons are it just isn't professional. Most people will see it that way and it might affect your next job. Another thing that's happening a lot on sets now, since everyone has a phone, including extras on a film, which are the people in the background, the crowds and that, um, they've got a phone and they're going to take, they're going to want to take pictures and then they're going to post them to social media. So on the last uh, three big films I worked on, they, just, they started taking phones away. Not taking phones away, but they had a special box. You'd put your phone inside the box, and you'd get your phone back at lunch. That was it. And Because they don't want to get burned. There's special, on Batman, there were, there were you know, the Batcave and Batmobile and all these other vehicles. They wanted to, you know, those kept secret. So no social network breaches. There's contracts that you sign that say that too. Make sure, you know, I don't know what the fine would be, but they'd come at you like that. And use common sense, right? Goodness sake. What do we do in Michigan? When like in weather like this where it's March, early March, and it's, well, it's 34 today, but it was 47 yesterday. You have to dress in layers. Uh, whether you're outside or inside, in the morning it might be like 37 degrees, in the afternoon it's going up to 60. You're not going anywhere, you have to keep a weather bag with you or dress in layers. That's what we do. I keep a weather bag with me. I'm near set usually, so I'm on a camera truck and I've got a duffel bag with everything I need. Extra socks, extra shoes, hats, gloves, everything I need um, to put on uh, if, if the weather changes. Um, a change of uh, socks or a change of shoes halfway through a 14-hour day makes your attitude change immediately. It really helps you out. Uh, I've worked with people that don't believe in deodorant or clean clothes, and you know, got to be said, it's it, it happens. And working in close proximity to them, I don't know, you got to keep it quiet or down, but it's not pleasant doing that. So, not only a good attitude, but clean clothes. Um, water, silly things happen. Water bottle. Um, before you give a water bottle to talent, you want to dry it off. Don't open it for them because then there, you know, might be danger. They might sense danger there. But you just dry it off so they're not, you know, they don't have dripping hands. Um, you even write their initials on it and your initials if it's your bottle. And you don't crinkle and crunch it if you want to keep friendly with the sound department. They don't like that. They're hearing everything on very sensitive microphones. Um, again, you know, a lot of people in the old days when I had uh, CRT monitors that were wider, I'd have water bottles, coffee cups, everything on my monitors. Now it's not so much because the surface area is much decreased. So 
pretty cool. But still, on the camera cards, they don't like that either. Uh, we try to be green. We try to recycle. On the big films, they actually have a position for that. They actually will go through the trash in a dumpster and find all that stuff, even though they have um, green containers, recycles, reused. They still go through the trash and, and pick it out. It's an actual job that a lot of uh, big films do. Um, Weather. This is Chicago on a bridge in Chicago. That's that technocrane that I mentioned earlier in the uh, Red Dawn. Um, my friend Mark Woods has this one. It's really snowy out there, and guess what? It might be slippery, too. So you've got to be careful. If you're working, if you're a production assistant, you might suggest to the AD that we get some salt out if the weather starts looking like that. Because these guys can slip and fall, and it's just going just gonna to slow down production. You're going to have to clean up blood. It's ugly. So, yeah, just, you know, it's just a safety thing. Um, I was in Alaska um, back in 2014, and I learned some new things. Uh, this book brought me to Alaska. Long story, but I was in Alaska, and um, they talked to me about working on the glacier. And, you know, who knew? One, it's below zero most of the time. And the camera assistants or a camera operator, you know, you're using your fingers. You want to keep using them. Uh, but you can't wear gloves. So what they do is they get a C-stand out and they put uh, battery operated gloves on there that are big so all you have to do is dip your hands in there and warm up and then you go back out so you're protecting yourself. Also in cold, what you know, you have got to hydrate too especially if you're on the glacier. And then um, also if there's any clouds showing up, a location manager that knows things like what clouds look like when there's a storm coming. It's very important because it's not easy to get off a glacier. So I'm told. So that's it. So you have to be ready to take action. If you think it's going to rain, um, talk to the ADs about getting covers on electronics. Batteries don't like getting wet. Neither do cameras. Neither do um, sound department guys. Um, I think we covered that. Also, I mentioned working in a bank or working in... Uh, active places, places that are hot. I've worked in many grocery stores. Uh, this is a Bell Tire. Uh, do you see any problems over here? Well, there's one big one right there. It's, you know, somebody, it's probably going to be me, is going to get my foot caught in that loop and fall into the trash can. It, it just can happen. So if you're a PA, you might mention it to the grips or the electrics. Say just, you know, could you, you know, either tape that down or roll it up a little bit, dress it up pretty nice. That ladder, it's safe, it's in the back room, no one's in there. But one of the things that people don't realize, a Bell Tire is, uh, is a shop where you might find 10 or 15 people using the bathroom, for example. On a film crew, there might be double that amount. So guess what, somebody's got to uh, deal with that and it's not the Bell Tire people whose responsibility it is. So it's a PA's responsibility to empty the trash, God help them if they have to do this, but uh, <laughs> that has happened. You know, it's just you know overworking a, a a public restroom that's got you know one hole in it. So be aware of that. Uh, once again, the safety part of it. Go up the chain of command. Um, don't be afraid to report it. Um, there's also things like this as you get up in the world, knowing about wind and how that's going to affect a ladder or a lift. Um, there are actually apps for that that show you if your tilt is too shallow. You can't figure that out for yourself. Um, we, on, on most of the films I've ever worked on, you travel between locations on a flatbed with your equipment in the back. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> it's unsafe. There's no seat belts. It's not a passenger vehicle. But that's how we do it, and that's how they still do it. Now I say something, you know, can you give us a harness? You know, can you help us out? That's what we have to do. Um, safety meetings happen. Uh, this is Red Dawn again. The assistant director is with the megaphone right there. The director's in the cowboy hat. And uh, they're about to blow up. These two vehicles, these military vehicles on either side, are about to blow up this car and that car. And all these people are going to scatter again. And I'm on the roof where there's also uh, weapons being fired into the crowd. Not real, but so they're going to give us, this guy's talking about that. This is what we're going to do. This is when we're going to do it. 
there'll be a call for fire in the hole. That's when car one goes off, fire in the hole when car two goes off. And this is what you do, you stay away from those cars. Be out of that way and they're gonna have people making sure that you're out of the way. So a safety meeting is always done when you're using animals, fire, anything along that line. I'll tell you another story. Um, on film Eight Mile, um, did anyone see that film? There was a scene where the house burned. Okay, it took us pretty much to the end of the film to find a house to burn, a city that would let us burn a house down. Uh, Highland Park is where we ended up, but we had to uh, buy gas for their fire truck because at the time they were in bankruptcy and they couldn't afford gas to run their fire truck. So we did that, but we had 24 hours to prepare the house, which was not in as bad condition as we set it up to be. They used paint, they used shellac, they used a lot of chemicals, but it didn't have time to set. So we walked into that house with propane burners, not me, but the effects people, with propane burners and things to simulate fire. Eminem was the star on that film, Marshall Mathers, and we, um, he was told to, uh, when the flames come up to about this high, you go out this window which we had prepared with, with steps if he wanted to, or he could jump another way into mattresses. That was not mattresses, but inflatable mattresses. Um, so he was all set, he was good with it. We had four cameras in a room when this was happening. A uh, match was thrown, the house was lit, the flames went right to the ceiling because of all those chemicals. Marshall knew what to do, he jumped right out of there. But all four camera guys, I have video footage of this still, where they're, you know, they've got Panavision cameras on their shoulders, and they're, they're, you know, going around. What should we do? You know, we got to get out of here. They're holding the cameras to their faces. They ended up dropping. They were told to drop their cameras and run out. But it took them a while to get out. But you know, and there was a, you know, stern talking to after that. That was a very bad example. Um, all my videotapes at that time were taken for insurance reasons. So, yeah, it was a very bad situation. But. No one died, people had burns, but you have to be careful. And they didn't understand that, and now they know. Then they, after that, they knew. I mentioned the hot set, the fire watch. On this set, you want to make sure that door is open. You want to make sure that that phone is still hung up. Um, you want to make sure that it's exactly as it was before lunch. These are all things that you do for set housekeeping. I mentioned the base camp before. This is what part of one looks like. This was right across the street from my house in Novi, Novi High School, many years ago. These were uh, talent trailers for the major characters in this film. Uh, working trucks, when you're on a set, this was for um, uh, winter, A Low Winter Sun, a Scottish film retooled to be shot in Michigan. This was a uh, grip truck, this is the camera truck, video assist is over here. Sound is over here. Uh, this, this is the equipment for the camera department, and we're working in that burned out house. That HGTV, who's that woman from HGTV? She rehabbed that house, and now it looks beautiful. <laughs> but this is what we look like on a set. There's working trucks, and there's base camp vehicles. I showed you the base camp. That's what that looks like. This is what a set looks like on a location. There's trucks for grips, electric, props, everybody so you don't have to run too far away from the set. Um, this is another view of base cam from high atop a building. Camera truck, AD, uh, this is a uh, bathroom, they actually have mobile bathrooms, um, dressing rooms, uh, props, uh, ADs, so everyone's got a truck. And sometimes imagine that, if you're a location person, you've got to figure out square footage. Yes, we want to put 20 trailers in your parking lot. Is there enough room to actually do that? And in the city, we didn't have enough room. This guy's off, you know, he's out in front of the parking lot. We bought the parking lot, we had complete access to it, and the guy was well paid, but trucks had to be in, in and around that and in the alley. So um, these, this is called a honey wagon. Um, it's a colloquial term for a bathroom but it's also uh, dressing rooms. These, these are convertible. You can make them into dressing rooms or with a little retooling into bathrooms. 
But um, yeah, so that's what comes on to a set as well. On a big movie, not on a commercial. On a commercial, it would be a motorhome. This is, uh, again, a location set with film. There's two cameras, typically. Um, my friend is doing sound over there. Um, Gaffer standing on that solid right there. But there's a bunch of us and all the activities in front of the cameras. So again, if uh, and another thing is, so we get a lot of theatrical work in town. So if you're working on a theatrical show or uh, like the auto show, something like that, they want you to wear blacks. So they call them show blacks. Have you ever had to do that, Brian? No. Well, you're pretty close to it right now. You could just strip off a layer and you'd be a, a, a ninja. So that's what we do quite often. If I work at the soundboard in uh, the Motor City Casino or at uh, Cobo Hall, they want you to wear your show blacks. You are invisible to the clients, and they know that's your uniform. They know who you are. You're, you're, some, you're a crew ninja. This is a sound cart. This is what, uh, remember I mentioned sides earlier? These are sides. It's a long strip of sides. Usually they're all bunched together in a little book. But the utility guy, the sound man's, uh, sound woman, sound man's uh, assistant, um, sees what dialogue we're going to be shooting in the next couple of hours. And he or she tapes all that together so the sound person can follow and direct the boom operator on who to point to at, at what point, if that makes sense. So that's that job. Script supervisor, she has a lot of work to do. At the beginning of the show, even before the movie goes, pre-production, um, she is breaking down the script, determining that, you know, how many props we need, how many sets we need to be on, interior, exterior, all that work, even before the filming. And then she makes sure that everything is uh, continuity, person has a cigarette in the, in the right hand, making sure that it's the right size and the right hand. Um, and now they're using computers to do that work. I don't know how they do that, take all those notes on a the computer. They used to do it in shorthand or, uh, or just you know handwritten notes, but now they're using computers to do it. Uh, oh, that's me. I forgot I had that in there. Okay, so that, they had me on a, uh, this is a uh, camera truck. Um, I had my director's monitors up there. The director would be comfortably seated on furniture pads. I'm strapped to the outside of a truck that's in motion and uh, you know, shooting two cameras which are on a, uh, a rig. There's a car on the rig. There's two cameras looking in the windows and we're just ahead of it. So that's a video assist guy's view. Uh, this is a digital image tech. Digital image tech is, uh, he works more than me. This guy, because video assist is a job that um, if Jeremy, who's shooting this right now, wanted to look on his card to see what everything looks like, um, he can do that. Video assist was better for film because you, can, um, uh, you couldn't look at it back on film, right? You had to look at it on the video playback. But now everything's digital. So we keep our jobs by, I mentioned earlier that the media goes away twice a day. My media stays on my drives all the time. A digital image tech uh, is the person that color, makes sure that the LUTs, if you ever work with LUTs, are there and gives you an idea of maybe what a better LUT might look like if you don't like it. Um, he makes sure that the look of the show is, is fine, you know, is good throughout the show, is consistent throughout the show. That's an example of what his card looks like. Um, makeup and wardrobe and sound, working with this guy from a GM commercial. They're making sure that he's it's like 95 degrees outside, so he's got an umbrella. And uh, this is her typical wardrobe uh, uniform. She's got a bag there, and she's got the wardrobe ready to go in case they say, no, no, we don't like that shirt. So there's also this, if you're a freelancer and you are working and you're used to working a nine to five job, maybe, you know, in an office or something like that, you're going to get a paycheck every week, hopefully, or every two weeks. Um, as a freelancer, you might get uh, 150 
to $250 as a PA a day for working. But, you know, that sounds great, right? That doesn't sound bad for working a day and maybe you work three days. So, but the problem is that you have to take taxes out of that because they're not taking taxes out. And uh, you also have to pay for your own health and pension because you are on your own. So that money starts being chipped away. And you want, and you're not working every day either. You hope to, and you're making, you're, you're working with your network and making things happen for yourself. So the golden cage idea means that the work is so good you don't want to give it up, but maybe you have to have a side job, another job. Actors, for example, often work at jobs where they can get off at a moment's notice. Sales jobs typically. Yeah, there's the pay rates, 275. Features, uh, features ironically are less pay. Uh, a PA will make $100 a day on a feature film because it's going to be 62 days. That's a theory. Commercials, you work less days, you get higher pay. That's the, that's the theory of that. People ask, I mentioned about the, um, the pen, also have an organizer. I used to have a month at a glance, but now I just have everything in my phone. Someone calls me for a job, like happened this morning, I just got a job for Friday and Saturday. I put it into my calendar, and I know it's there, and it's synced to my computer at home, so I'm good. Uh, but there's these things called pencil holding book. You only see those on commercials or corporate jobs, or not on feature films. A pencil means that they're thinking about using you, or the job is maybe, so they give you a call, they want to make sure they get their crew that they want. So you're penciled in. So if you get a call from another client, um, you can say, well, I'm penciled in on this other job, let me call them back and see if I can go to you. So you have to keep you know, things rolling, you don't want to burn any bridges. Uh, once the job is uh, stronger, they give you a hold, that means that you know it's a firm thing. The job is going to go until it doesn't, and then they'll say, you know, we're going to book you, and then it's a pretty solid job. You're going to go, and if uh, 24 hours in advance, if they they say no, nope, we're not going to use you, or the job's not going to go, then you're paid for your labor, your equipment, not so much. Then there's the concept of double booking. Um, to give you an example of that, I once worked for GM uh, in the Rensen. I had a job in the afternoon and suddenly I had a job in the morning like at 6 a.m. and I thought okay I have the script in my hand I think I can do this I think it's only going to be three hours at most so I, I took it and it's not a bad story and you know I, I was in GM and the second job was like on the upper floor the first job was on the lower floor I had an hour between the jobs I couldn't believe it. I double booked myself. But in this case, I won. I made two day rates. Sometimes you can get burned. That first job, the guy would have been late. Um, could have been, you know, they, they want to go over. They want to say, oh, one more thing. Oh, by the way, that kind of thing. But it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. That's double dipping. Double booking is a bad thing. You don't want to ever be unavailable for a client where you, you book yourself on a job for a Wednesday, the client calls and another client books you on a Wednesday. Or what usually happens is they've got a three-day job, Monday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and you say, well, I'm, you know, I've got a job already. You've got to accept that first job or you're going to burn a bridge. So you don't want to double book yourself. We're almost done. Um, so immersing yourself is a very important thing. Uh, there's so many social media nets, Mandy.com, Staff Me Up, Facebook, behind the, uh, Below the Line is a, is a magazine that you can read online. I've got to change that. MFP Group is now uh, Groups.io, Michigan Film Production on Groups.io. The Michigan Film Office website often has something. Michigan Production Alliance, I recommend that you check us out all the time on our social media. Um, just just get your network together, get experienced on whatever you can do, get credits somehow, some way. Even if it's a small show like the 48 hour film festival that Jerry, uh, Jeremy mentioned this morning, those are great opportunities to meet people and to hone your skills.
Um, spend time on a cover letter. I think cover letters are still important in the digital world. Uh, most places that are taking digital uh, information from you leave you room to write a cover letter. I have a couple different cover letters, that's what computers are for, ready to go so I can cut and paste them into that kind of thing. Um, one guy gave me an email address once when he was looking for a job, sexwax at hotmail.com. You know, that gave like kind of raised a red flag that he's going to use that. You can have that email, but have another one that's more, you know, quiet for an email address. Uh, and again, build your credits and network. I've seen cover letters that don't have grammar. I mean, people don't spell my name right or their name right. You know, they missed it. They didn't check it. So easy to do now. Sometimes spell check is a little too much, but come on. Uh, this is from my friend Ideen, who is an international rock star of a PA. Don't lie on your resume. Refer to number one. People do that. They'll, they'll take your work. I can go on the uh, IMDB, which is an internet movie database, and I can find Mark Adler, who did the uh, film editing for Amadeus. I can say, I'll put that on my resume. What a great idea. Until someone finds out, and then, you know, that doesn't work. So don't lie on your resume. Um, these are some universities, if you don't know already. Um, Lawrence Tech, EMU, WSU, MSU, Ferris, WCC, Motion Picture Institute. All these places have various forms of film programs. How are you doing? Um, so if you haven't done that and you're interested in a college career, which I highly recommend if someone's going to pay for your college, do it. Absolutely do it. These are the unions in town. If you want to be in the camera department, IATSE Local 600, which is not a local, it's an international. 38 covers sound, video assist, boom operators, prompter, and riggers, stagehands, set deck, vanities, which we call makeup, hair, and wardrobe. Uh, grips and gaffers, props, craft, and script, all under 38's umbrella. Uh, IATSE 700 if you want to be a union editor around the country. If you want to be a script supervisor, it's IATSE 161, also for accountants. POC and APOC are in the office, production office coordinator and assistant. In uh, Grand Rapids, there's one, a local uh, 26. Here we are in Lansing, 274. That's what a lot of these guys that work here are in, and 395 is in Ann Arbor. So if you're interested in the union, you can look on their websites and find out what it takes to become a union member. DGA mentioned also, IBEW is another place for electricians, Society of Operating Cameramen, Teamsters, those are the guys that work most on feature films. They're the ones that pull, you saw those trailers at the base camp? They're the guys that pull those things. And when we're done for the night, those guys are still working, dragging the trailers to the next location. So they're pretty much on the clock 24 hours, or 18 hours a day. Uh, let's see, sag after for actors. And are you sag after, by the way, Brian? Yeah. I'm coming back to you. SAG and AFTER used to be separate organizations, now they are together. Um, other places that you can look, I mentioned the Michigan Film Office before. There's also a West Michigan Film Office. There's a group that gives ideas to the Michigan Film Office called the Michigan Film Office Advisory Council. Again, Michigan Production Alliance, and there's the direct link uh, to Michigan Film Production Group on Groups.io. It's like a newsletter discussion group. SEMPTI meets often if you're technical minded. They meet around Detroit area and Lansing. The West Michigan Film Video Alliance is like Michigan Production Alliance. And the Women in Communications is another group that's very strong in this area. Uh, stages, Studio Center is pretty much the only stage left in Detroit, sadly. I was just there yesterday. It's a very nice stage to work in. But sadly, again, the only stage around that's big enough. These are some of the production companies that are around town. I mentioned Jackson Dawson, um, Rare Medium Well Done, Capture, Avalon Films. There's so many. Every time I look, there's a new production company in town. But these are the places that you could look at. I used to look in a phone book. Now I look online pretty much every six months, and I find new ones, and I try to plant seeds. I'm Johnny Appleseed in that regard. I'm always planting seeds to try to get more work. Can't wait for it to come to you.
So if you've listened to me, you understand what I say, that's great. You're now a media warrior, thank you very much. If you don't have any questions, please check out Michigan Production Alliance. Join us, we're at uh, NABIS advocacy group. Uh, right now, after this, I'm gonna run down to Detroit to a, uh, uh, a group that's fundraising for Michigan Film Incentives. We've been writing a bill for that. And uh, so that's my next uh, engagement. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, do look us up. Appreciate your time. Thank you.